Yesterday I found myself being overwhelmed by sloppy thoughts, a tsunami of them. No thank you didn't work. <laughs> this happens often after I've had a profound experience of calm or bliss. Is this just my mind's resistance? Can you elaborate on why this happens? And is keep practicing the only answer? Thank you. Cool, very relevant question, because everyone, in my estimation, will have these waves. So I've noticed this mechanism, if you want, operated myself and others over the years. And it is now you don't have to create it. So what I'm about to explain, I don't want you to artificially start expecting it or creating it. But what can happen sometimes is that if you reach, say, a new level of calm or bliss or recognition, or awakening, that can be followed up by more challenging or more messy or more chaotic or more busy sort of mind wave reaction doesn't have to happen immediately, it can happen a couple of days later, for instance. Um, but there seems to be some logic, some rhythm, some physics to this mechanism, this wave, if you will. Sometimes I've called it the peaks and the valleys. So they're not ups and downs. Life doesn't have ups and downs. Life has peaks and valleys peaks where your attention is clear, more naturally awake, more naturally present, more naturally calm, harmonized and focused and available, where more of your free will is kind of just resting in a balanced equation of liquidity, and you feel like you have greater power, greater freedom, greater peace, your connection with yourself seems to be easier to feel to experience. And then typically those peak moments are followed up with valleys. And why I renamed them peaks and valleys instead of ups and downs is because down typically indicates negative peaks or sorry, ups typically indicate or are associated with positive. But peaks are positive and valleys are positive. Some people like to live in the valley, some people like to live on the peaks. Um, and there is a very profound usefulness in the valleys, that if we just dismiss it by labeling it downs, or off days, and nothing wrong with off days, I use that too, sometimes like, well, you're gonna have your off days, that's okay. Uh, where the connection doesn't feel as strong, doesn't feel as available, doesn't feel as vivid. And in those sort of valley experiences that can only come after a peak, because without the peak, no valley, right? Uh, several things can occur, but typically the essence of what happens when we enter into a valley experience is that when we peak, first of all, it's like we penetrate into a deeper level of creation, a deeper level of our very own consciousness, our very own nature, our existence. And in those peaks, where there's greater clarity, there's greater vividness, there's greater realization that's occurring, stronger connection with what we truly are. That's great when we feel blissful, typically, because in contrast to our ordinary state, the peaks are an elevated experience, the connection feels greater, feels better. So we'll have more experiences of peace and bliss and joy and love and so forth. And it seems easier, it seems to come easier to us. Sometimes it happens after deliberate concentration or meditation as well. So it's not always that it just happens. It can also be cultivated by meditation. But then if we sort of like get elated because of this experience, and especially if we start labeling it like, Oh, now I'm there, or, Oh, I no longer have to deal with this or that, or I have fully transcended, I'm now fully enlightened Buddha, or whatever such terms you may want to give to the peak experiences or faces or stages, um, you're going to kind of knock yourself off alignment again. That's one element of it. 
if you start giving things meaning, if you start giving joyful peak experiences, meaning, you will find that that meaning will be undermined in the following valley experience, you will be humbled again. So watch for giving things too much meaning, because where does meaning come from? And this may be a bigger topic that stands on its own, may not fit in entirely with the meditation retreat so much, but I've addressed this in many of my talks. Um, so in short, meaning is optional, nothing has inherent meaning. Why do we give meaning to certain things? You can always find that there is a cause root of insecurity there. If we weren't insecure about who we were, if we weren't insecure about the true nature, uncertain, ignorant of the true nature of what we are, then we wouldn't have such a need to define things, to give things labels, to give things meaning. And there's a distinction also between giving something a name and giving it meaning. You can give something a name because it's practical to do so, but not give it that meaning. When you give things meaning and significance, which the spiritual community is exceedingly good at doing, and it is a distortion, it's not purity, it's not balance, it's not next level awakeness. But it's a phase people go through because we come from the cesspool of needing to give meaning to certain things because those become our insistences, those become our mainstays, our hold on tos, our uh, solid structures in life that we feel like we can derive a sense of self from, a sense of identity, a sense of I know, a sense of certainty, a sense of safety, and so forth, a sense of accomplishment, a sense of worthiness. That's why we give things meaning. So the root cause of having to give something meaning, which distorts the thing itself, the thing itself is now covered over with meaning, it's no longer appreciated, it's no longer allowed to be as it is. Again, once you teach a child the name of a bird, it will never see the bird again. It'll just see the name, its associations with it, its pictures of it, and so forth. It's a true art to return to the ability that we naturally have before the age of two or so, of just observing things as they are, being with things almost. It's not even observing, although that's a part of it, you could say, but it's like we're just being present with something exactly as it is without meaning. It doesn't mean anything yet. And therefore we can see clearly. Meaning is a great distorting power. And we should use it mindfully, carefully, and sparingly. The less we give things meaning, the more the natural nature of ourselves can shine forth, the more our natural happiness, our natural humility, our natural confidence, our natural generosity, our natural nature can show itself, can show up in our actions, can inform our thoughts and our speech, that we're naturally in the flow with all of life. There's a wholeness to our connection with this moment. As soon as I give something meaning, now there's subject object duality, the ego comes in, the ego effect, I should say, because the ego doesn't really exist. It's just an effect. It's just a sensation. It's a construct. It's an idea. But nevertheless, we operate by that idea. So we generate so much separation, so much feelings of separation and lack by giving things meaning. But then we want to sustain it. And we, we are so afraid typically to let go of giving things meaning because what if I stop giving meaning to all the pleasurable things in my life, all the things that give me so much joy? The things don't give you joy. It's your meaning being in alignment. The meaning you give it, the interpretation you're giving something is of a high vibratory nature. That's why you experience things such as joy from certain people, events, activities. It's because you give it positive meaning and positive interpretation is closer to your true nature than negative interpretation based in lack and insecurity and so forth. But for most humans, because insecurity has become so conditioned, thinking of ourselves as a small, tiny little physical creature with a personality that's constantly attacked by uh, this, the social standards around it, the physical events that occur and so forth. Coming from that state of personhood consciousness, identification with personhood, person assumption, person ideas, we start giving things meaning in very sort of separate little chunks like this is bad. I want to avoid this. This is good. I want more of this. I want to hold on to this, right? That's the nature of attachment. Once we give something positive meaning in the midst of a lot of negative meanings, we start to give that so much meaning and significance. It becomes heavy. It becomes intense. And even if it gives you joy at some point, 
the heaviness of needing to maintain giving that thing meaning, the artificial nature of having to give things meaning, which they don't inherently have or possess, is at some point in your spiritual journey going to tire you out. I won't go further into this trend because it's a longer conversation. Again, I want to focus back on the material for today. But that's one element. It's that your meanings get to deshuffled when you have a peak experience, especially a spiritual peak experience, where you are seeing through some layers of the personality construct, for instance, the ideas you have about yourself and you say, hey, they're not true. And maybe you're entering into a higher frequency of consciousness, a higher clarity of your connection with your own self, your own beingness, your essential self. As a result, you feel all these beautiful, natural qualities that don't need meaning to be present. You are naturally joyful. You're naturally happy. You're naturally radiant. You're naturally generous. You're naturally free. So by not giving anything meaning, or at least dropping your insistence and attachment to meaning, for instance, in a moment of meditation, you're going to set yourself up to have experiences of greater joy than you're used to, than, than is your average baseline. So you could call that a peak or valley, sorry, a peak or elevated trend or experience. Now, if you're unable to quote unquote, naturally maintain that because meaning comes back in what, what does this mean? What does my peak mean? You start giving it meaning like, oh, now I'm enlightened. I never have to meditate again, da, da, da. And you start hanging a self image, your insecure self image travels with you along your spiritual realizations and experiences. That's why I often symbolically say, as some of you will know, the absolute is what I call the most absolute real level of reality. And sometimes I say, even though there is no person there, there's no separation, there's not even a universe at the absolute level of reality. Still, I sort of jokingly sort of realistically say, you will take your personality with you all the way into the absolute. So watch for that tendency of personalizing everything, giving it meaning, making it about what you've now accomplished and what that means about your ego in reference to others and so forth. So the more meaning you give to your peak experiences, the more you react to your elevated states, the harder the comeback is typically going to be. In Holland, we have a saying, Hochmut kommt vor der Fall, or uh, there are similar sayings in English, or Hoge Boma fange veel wind, which means uh, high trees catch a lot of wind, right? So the trees that stick out, they will get the majority of the wind. So when you get, basically when you get cocky, when you start giving things meaning and you start possessing your elevated experiences, oh, I did that, or I have this now, or I can now have this joy. Then again, that separation comes in, that insecure little self image comes in. So the art really is to let that go and to allow your meditations to be good or not good, free and empty or filled with chaos and not give it so much meaning. Hence the preparatory mantra, it does not matter what my experience contains. It's got nothing to do with my freedom. It doesn't matter what I experience. I don't want anything from anything. Again, great to enter these preparatory states and kind of anchor in those understandings so that when you do have elevated peak experiences in your meditations or just in your spiritual inside or in life in general, the come down of that will not be so great. And then it will be more of a valley rather than a downfall. It'll be a valley experience where you can integrate what you've now glimpsed, what you've now realized or seen or experienced that was different or elevated beyond your ordinary level of perception. And now you may have a phase where you kind of integrate that. You kind of come back to the person level more and you're trying to make sense of it, but try to minimize how much meaning you give to it. Just try to kind of let it settle in. Just try to accept the new reality that you've glimpsed, the new possibility, and also accept the fact that in response to that, which is the second main element to your question, which I think is relevant for everyone, is that there is this natural physics almost, or metaphysics perhaps, to coming down from an elevated spiritual, expanded consciousness, meditative experience of, of a non-separate kind of joy or bliss or unity or freedom, and then the integration phase of kind of integrating that into your day to day sense of who you are, your sense of self will have to adjust. It's very rare that someone has sort of a, a peak 
Satori experience. And then they suddenly their whole personality construct completely accepts that new paradigm, just like that, and never goes back to wanting what it wanted before, or thinking, giving meaning to things the way it gave meaning to things before. It's very rare to have such a nonlinear interruption in going from oneself to a completely different radiant version of self. So typically, you'll have glimpses, you'll have peak experiences. And then there's the integrative phase of the valley experience, which is very important and valuable as well. So I want you to have a de positive definition of the valley experiences. But yes, it is like the mind construct, the personality construct, everything it's used to its memory, its sense of self, its sense of solidity is going to respond to that moment where all of that kind of fell away for a moment. Now it's trying to make sense of the gap of the emptiness of the freedom of the spontaneity of the, I don't know who I am, but it feels great or any variation of that, you know, and the more quote unquote profound or deep or penetrative, those peak experiences in your meditations are the more sometimes the personality construct is like, what the fuck just happened? Right? If it's a mild sort of like, oh, I was feeling really relaxed. That was nice. Huh, I was feeling connected to, to my sense of being present here in the body and hmm, which is great, but it's not the absolute level of glimpsing reality beyond all form and stuff like that. So the mind can sort of adjust that can kind of integrate that easily. It's like, Oh, this is just relaxation, or this is just huh, being more open minded or something like that. So it doesn't require a huge paradigm shift to be integrated. But if suddenly out of nowhere, never before have you had deep, profound meditation experiences, and suddenly you're going beyond even consciousness, and all that you experience is this infinite perfection beyond experiences, which has no ends, no beginnings, no time, no body, no universe, no world, no life. And yet it's perfect, absolute reality. Whoa, it's like a complete wake up moment from the entire matrix of experiences. Now you can imagine the mind has absolutely no symbology, no memory, no form, no person to talk to about this stuff, and so forth. So typically, then, there will be more of a what just happened, like, and then integrating that it's not like we're actually taking the absolute, and we're integrating it into the body or the mind or the personal life. It's not like that. By integration, I mean, that the understanding of the mind body spirit complex or smaller version of that of the personality or the mind is that its understanding needs time to adjust to that. It's like catching, catching your breath after a run or a sprint. It's like okay, catching back that oxygen of what you're familiar with and developing new shapes and symbols to be able to have a conscious intellectual also an emotional relationship to what you've just experienced and realized about the nature of reality. So that's kind of the nature of what you're experiencing. And it's very common on this path. So thank you for your question.